So welcome everyone uh, for today's talk by Gita Kutinyuk. So uh, Gita has done some wonderful and very impressive work on a huge range of uh, different topics of machine learning. So looking at approximation spaces in deep networks, transferability, solving PDEs uh, uh, using machine learning and, and all sorts of different areas. And um, she is uh, originally an applied harmonic analyst and um, she has invented uh, in the early 2000s the notion of or the concept of shearlets um, that uh, she will talk today about and how that relates into machine learning. So I'm very excited to have Gita here. So please, Gita. Thank you so very much. I mean, thanks so much for the very nice introduction and also for the invitation. It's a really great pleasure for me to be here. And I think it's also, I mean, always impressive how easy it is to give talks in Australia now, so all over the world. From my perspective, I mean, deep learning is a, is a very exciting area. There are a lot of problems, I mean, where mathematics is uh, required to a certain extent. And I mean, I myself actually came to this area from the area of imaging sciences, because around 2012, I mean, there were, uh, let's say, a lot of approaches using deep learning for these methods. And so then I kind of switched my research. One is in the direction of what, I, what I'm talking about, and then also in parallel developing theoretical uh, underpinnings for it. And so in this talk, I would like to, um, as Georg already said, tell you a bit about the area of imaging science, inverse problems, how you can use deep learning for pr particular problems. Um, I will then also touch upon um, how you can actually interpret the results. So this goes in the direction of explainability of neural networks, which also uh, to my mind, it's a very important topic for various areas. And then in the end, I will, would like to finish with a word of caution, uh, because we also looked at computability aspects, and there are some, let's say, curious insights into that sometimes you can actually not train neural networks with um, an arbitrary accuracy. Okay, so let's let's start slowly. I think, I mean, we all know how tremendously successful deep learning is these days in various applications, automatic driving, surveillance tasks, legal issues, also the healthcare sector, which unfortunately these days, as we know, became even more important than it already is. But um, still at this point, um, very few theoretical results explain their success, which is uh, a tremendous problem because we also have issues with approaches like, for instance, robustness issues. Um, so in that sense, uh, this is one particular instance that sometimes with small perturbations, there are drastic failures. And we know that, for instance, from automatic driving, um, if the science change slightly, then sometimes these cars make a completely wrong decision. Now, I would like to take you, as I said, in the area of imaging sciences and um, in particular medical imaging. And one very exciting, let's say, technology is computer tomography. Mm, and this will be our guiding example also to this talk. So what is computer tomography? Well, it does the following. You have the human body here. It computes line integrals through it. Uh, and then you get a 1D function. And this gives you one slice of the so-called sinogram. And then everything is rotated. Yeah? So from each angle, you acquire this data. And that way you fill the sinogram. And from this, you would like to recover the interior of the human body. Now, you, you get a problem if you don't, if you're not allowed to, or for some reason, for some reason concerning constraints, cannot acquire the entire sinogram. So if there's, let's say, a whole chunk missing. And so what this causes is what you see here. Um, so if this is, let's say, the clean image, then if you have a certain part missing here, I mean, it creates uh, a lot of artifacts. So things become very blurry in certain instances. And the key problem, which is now behind all of this, which you make then also precise, is that, I mean, data of that type, um, if you re would really like to precisely recover it, I mean, it's just too complex for mathematical modeling. So it's very, let's say, accessible to these learning methods. And therefore, people are that excited for instance, that, I mean, um, deep learning is there and also that you can use it for these problems. And this is particular, I mean, Georg just already mentioned uh, NUNET in the high dimensional regime to circumvent the curse of dimensionality. But here, in, some, in a certain sense, clear that this is, um, well, I mean, perfect scenario for learning type methods. And what you see in general is that some people aim to use neural networks end to end. 
just let neural networks solve the entire problem. But what I would like to also talk about today is um, that it is often the best to not throw everything overboard, to use as much physics insight and model-based insight as possible, and then combine it with, with neural networks. Now, so in a sense of an optimal balancing of data-driven and model-based approaches. So since I just said that, I mean, I would like to start telling you a bit about model-based approaches because then we will, in the end, um, combine that with neural networks. And the approach I would like to introduce you to is what's called sparse regularization. This is, has also to do with what Georg just said uh, to share this. Okay, so what, what is a, a general inverse problem? And in imaging sciences, most of the problems are of that type. And we will see many examples of that. Now, so you have um, your image, let's say F, you apply an operator to it, maybe um, a measurement operator like a CT scanner. G is what you then acquire as data, and then you want to invert this process and recover the F. Now, so therefore it's called inverse problem because you invert the operator K. And uh, a typical solution is um, this minimization problem. And you see if you solve this, yeah, so let's look at the terms. Uh, so you minimize over all f. Yeah, so here the problem is you, you know k and you know g, you would like to recover f. Now, so solving inverse, inverse problem. Um, and so here the first term, you see if you solve it and can bring it down to zero, then you solve this precisely. Yeah, but sometimes you have noise involved, so you don't want to bring this down to zero precisely. And then there's another term which is called penalty term or regularization term which allows you to incorporate additional properties of your solution F. And there is a whole zoo of different types of terms you can uh, put here. This alpha then balances between both terms. So depending on how you choose alpha, either you put more emphasis on solving the inverse problem as accurately as possible, or putting more emphasis on the properties you would like to have, you would like to recover F to have. So let, let's go back. So this penalty term, how, you, how can you choose that? So there's a general, let's say, paradigm, which is that the world is compressible. Um, yeah, and so here's an example. If you take an image and you compute a wave transform. So wave transform is also used in JPEG 2000, for instance. So what is a wave transform? Well, you have a representation system, typically an orthonormal basis. It looks in this case like this. So these are the elements of the system. You have a generating function, you translate it in time, and you also have a means to dilate it. And wave it's look, for instance, like this. And the transform maps an F, the function, to these inner products. So each pixel here corresponds to an inner product. <clears throat> and what you now observe is that many of those are black, which is zero. Others are white, and these are the only ones which are stored. And so this leads to these high compression rates and so on from these white, white pixels, you can then recover this precisely. But what it also tells you is that the world is compressible. So the key information is very sparse. Most of the information, these black areas is um, redundant or not necessary. Okay, so this is um, the, the general philosophy, which I mean, a lot of approaches, um, all those using sparsity in a certain sense follow. Mm. So how can you now penalize non-sparsity or non-compressibility? There's always this picture which, which one shows at this point. So let's assume you have here all possible uh, solutions. And now you know that you have sparsity, meaning you have a lot of zeros in your solution. How can you recover it? Well, if you minimize the L2 norm, so you have the L2 ball, which you blow up, you will hit it somewhere. And this is the minimal point on this line in the L2 norm. But the minimal point of the L1 norm is here. And that is the point which has one zero and one non-zero co component. Yeah, so the L1 norm promotes sparsity because it pushes the solutions towards the axis. And so this is what the sparse regularization is about. You see the penalty term, we now look at these products, inner products, let's say with wavelets. We saw many of those are equal to zero, very few of them are large. And so we penalize this now by putting the R1 on. 
Now, so then, I mean, if we minimize this, it will push the F towards that many of these inner products are equal to zero. Could you say something about the ill-posed term? Why is it called ill-posed? So it's ill-posed because um, the solution is, so, so it's ill-posed if the solution is not unique or if the solution does not depend continuously on the measurements. And so here, typically, I mean, in, in, in problems like this, you, if in underdetermined problems like this, you don't have a unique solution. So that's the hypothesis. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so now the question is how, how to choose this representation system. And so for this, I mean, we use the following observation that images are typically governed by edge-like structures. Uh, and you see this in various instances. Um, and so this is a phenomenon you would now like to encode. And this is also due to the fact that the human visual system is very tuned towards edges. Wavelets are not that good for that because, yeah, so you saw how wavelets look like. And now if you have edges in your image, you know, need a lot of wavelets to, for instance, approximate this edge. So a lot of wavelets, a lot of coefficients will not be equal to zero. And if you would have elements which are directional based themselves, then you might get away with very few of those. So this would correspond to very few of these inner products being large, most of them being equal to zero. So that way you might get better, let's say, or sparser um, inner products. And so there was the flurry of activity design systems like this. And I, I will show you how we designed shields in that regard, but let's, um, let's make this a bit more precise. So what are these, these shields? You see the elements here. This is what we aim to construct. And you see well, the definition here. Again, you have a generating function psi. Then you have um, <clears throat> a translation like wavelets. You translate your shields on the plane. You have uh, an, a matrix which scales shields, but it scales it in a different way than wavelets. It scales it in both directions differently. So that leads to the fact that as you see here, you get at fine scales, something very needle-like, so very anisotropic. And then since you have something which is directional based, you need a third operation, which changes the orientation of those. Yeah, and so if you look now in a um, frequency domain or free domain, you see that these shearlets tile the free domain in this way. So each of these, um, which like shaped objects correspond to certain types of, of shields. So you see, I mean, you see the different scales here and then you see the decomposition into different directions. So that looks very good. And I mean, just on a high level viewpoint because that's not the main part of this talk. One can show within a model situation, which are cartoon-like functions and cartoon-like functions um, are basically defined like this on a unit square compactly supported and they are C2 apart from a C2 discontinuity curve. So they are very much like a model for functions governed by anisotropic structures or by direction structures. And one can show that chillets have optimal compression rates for those. Um, so to conclude this part, let me also say, if you're interested in general in using representation systems like chillets for imaging sciences, we have an extensive software library here, shilab.org, where you can download also demos. Okay, so this is a general approach, but now, I mean, we need to let, in, in the end, a bit more. Um, you saw here, we just look at the edges, but uh, we need also the directionality in a certain sense. Um, and for this, I would like to now delve a little bit deeper into computer tomography to um, discuss why we require this. Yeah, so computer tomography is our running example, as said. So here now you see the precise definition. First, I did a bit of hand waving, but here you see now the, uh, how the, how is, what a CT scanner in detail does. It computes the random transform. Uh, you have your F here. You compute line integrals with different uh, angles and different offsets. And um, then you get the random transform for each angle and for each offset. And the problem is also said, already said is if 
you cannot acquire the entire sinogram, so you're missing parts of your radon transform, in particular, if you cannot do the full 180 degrees. And that's the problem, for instance, in many applications like electron tomography, you see here this device where the probe is sitting in here, but if you turn it, you cannot turn it 180 degrees because then the rays cannot get through. Okay, so what, what is the, the problem now if you recover? Um, so this is a recovery from if you just have plus and minus 15 degrees. That's only what you acquire. And then you see the reconstruction looks terrible. You cannot see anything. Now I increase the area uh, where I acquired my data. So if I do that, I get a better and better reconstruction. And what you also observe here is that in certain areas, um, you already see edges at a very early stage. Now, so already here. And then at some point, also the others reveal themselves. So that means the directionality of these play a tremendous role when you recover. Now, so there are certain parts which are already visible at an early stage and others are not. And you can imagine intuitively why this is the case, because if you, if you now um, have your line integrals in this direction, then certainly these are very discovered at a very early stage, whereas these are smeared out. Okay, so not only positions of edges, but their directionality plays a, plays a role. And so there's a well, mathematical notion which makes this precise, which is the so-called wavefront set. Um, not going into too much detail. So this comes from micro local analysis. You see, I mean, if this is your singularity curve, then at each point, the singularity has a certain direction. And so the wavefront set is now the points of the singularity curve together with the direction. You can visualize this in what's called phase space. You see here the plane, the points, the positions of the singularity, and the third axis is the angle. So each point here now is mapped to one point on this angle axis. And so this gives a structure like this. Huh? So this is a, the wavefront set. And well, shields are very good in detecting the wavefront set. In fact, one can compute the, the shield transform, meaning the inner products of F with all shields, looking at the K properties in a certain manner, and via this precisely detect the wavefront set. Uh, so there are theoretical results which show this that um, shields are able to precisely resolve, resolve wavefront sets. Um, so that sense, I mean, they are very um, flexible. Uh, they're easily generated, they resolve the wavefront set. We have optimality results, um, high spatial localization. And what is also nice is that um, we have faithful implementations of those. Okay, so let's now delve a bit more into uh, deep learning and let's see how we can use this um, for problems of this type. So now, I mean, if you have such an inverse problems, how can you use neural networks? What you can do is you can certainly first solve your problem. The solution might not be that great, but then you can use a neural network afterwards to take care of the noise. Yeah, so that's the most direct approach. You first recover and then you apply a neural network to improve the reconstruction. Uh, so that's a very ad hoc approach, which just puts one method at the other. There are other approaches which use, which look at this, for instance, this bus regularization procedure. Yeah, so you solve this minimization problem. You use, you, you do that typically use an iterative procedure. And now, if you look at this iterative solver, you realize that certain parts are, for instance, like a denoising step. Now, neural networks are very good in denoising. So you can replace parts of it by a neural network. So basically you still keep your iterative solver, but you replace parts of it with a neural network. Uh, so this is what's called plug and play. Uh, so basically you, you, you overall still solve the same problem, um, hopefully. Uh, and then, I mean, again, you can start with an iterative solver and you can, well, you can involve a neural networks in a much more 
uh, extensive manner than just replacing the denoising step. You can replace also other steps, uh, learn those in a particular manner. So that's what called learned iterative schemes. And what you can also do is you can use um, a neural network as a prior in a certain sense. So you can imagine that your solution is, um, uh, you can generate by such a generative model. So a generative model would be that the output of a neural network. And so you can assume that um, natural images look like this. So there's also the, the deep, deep prior uh, approach. So there are various possibilities how to combine um, model-based approaches or solvers with neural networks. Huh? So there are, I mean, it's a whole zoo out there. Um, what I would like to show you here is uh, what, what we use as our philosophy in a certain sense. So our mission is to use model-based approaches as far as they are reliable, to drive them as far as um, you can, and then only apply deep neural networks when it is necessary. And the advantage is here certainly that you keep the network under control since, as I said, I mean, it has often certain problems, robustness problems, um, and you know exactly what it does, and the model-based approach gives you then more stability, and we will see examples in that direction there. So the guiding principle overall will be always, as I said before, edges are key features, so we uh, aim for recovering the, the wavefront set in a certain sense. Okay, so this is uh, the first, what I would like to show you, what, what we call learning the invisible. So it is solving this limited angle computer tomography problem. And again, I mean, the philosophy is taking the best out of both worlds, out of the model-based and the data-driven world. So the model-based world, we now use sparse regularization um, as far as it's reliable. And for the data-driven world, we use uh, neural networks. And this we already saw, we have uh, this problem that if we recover only parts of it, we might recover some edges very precisely and other edges we don't have any, any chance. So what we, we can now phrase the problem in the following way. Remember this definition of a wavefront set. If you now look at the wavefront set of such an object, we see that certain parts of the wavefront set you already know for a certain angle. So you know the position and the direction and other parts you don't know. So basically you have now the problem to recover parts of a wavefront set. Yeah, and so the model-based approach can only, let's say, recover these parts of the wavefront set which you have in your data. And then the neural network needs to fill that in and in that sense, in paint the wavefront set. So that way you can very clearly separate what your model-based approach and what your data driven approach should do. Ah, and so we use shields for, for those. Okay, so this is the approach. What you see here is this classical sparse regularization. Nothing has changed here. The Radon transform is your operator. You have here the data fidelity term. And here you have the L1 term, the penalty or regularization term, where here, these are the inner products of F with shields. Yeah, so that's very classical. The weights only come in because you have a multi-scale system. And your recovery will not look great no? because you have this missing angle. And so you get, well, images of this type where you have, it's, it's hard to see right now, you see it a bit larger later, where you have a lot of blurry parts here and here. What we now do is we would like to analyze what has been already precisely recovered and what needs to be taken care of. And the way we do that is we apply another shielded transform. So again, taking now this F star and again, looking at inner products with shields. Then when we realize that some of these inner products are almost equal to zero, so there we didn't recover anything and others are reliable and nearly perfect. And these we keep, we don't touch them. Uh, and so an end-to-end -end deep learning approach would also destroy those and, and modify them. But here we keep them and only now train a neural network to recover these parts. <coughs> now, so we train now a neural network 
from these reliable ones, these visible ones, recover the invisible ones, these. Uh, and so then, I mean, we now, in the end, have the visible ones, we add the invisible ones, so what the neural network gave us, and we bring everything back in the image domain. We do that, and there's a very classical neural network, which one always uses in inverse problems. It's a so-called U-net, yeah, and you see what's called a U-net. Um, it's shaped like a U, yeah, so the U-net uh, for inverse problems typically does the following. We have our input, it compresses the input first, it expands it again, because you would like to have here also an image as an output. Since you lose information, a unit has skip connections to trans to be able to transfer also information between the different components. Uh, so that, that's very classical. Okay, so the approach, and we will show you now some numerical examples. I mean, the advantages from our perspective that we only learn what needs to be learned, that gives us much more stability than end-to-end -end approaches. We know exactly what the neural network does. It does this recovery or in-painting of the wave front set. And the neural network does not process the entire image. So that gives you stability. Yeah, we, we believe maybe it also has better generalization properties, um, meaning if you have, let's say, other types of data that you can transfer it to that. But yeah, it's, it's, this is very hard to. To, to determine, you can only look at different examples. Certainly, I mean, the speed is dominated by the L1 minimization. Okay, and yeah, so this is our, I mean, the data we use from, from Mayo Clinic in the US. We have a 60 degree missing angle, and we will then test everything also on other types of data um, with a 30 degree missing angle where the neural network only was only trained on these type of images. Yeah? So that tests the generalization ability and we will see that the results are also quite nice. So we, we only train the neural network on images of humans in some sense, and then we expose it to something completely different. Okay, so that's the ground truth. Um, that's a very crude reconstruction. Mm, yeah, so what you see here is a relative error. And this is a measure for image recovery quality, which is also based on wavelets. Um, yeah, so it's hard, quite hard spy. And it, it's much more adapted to the human visual system than for instance, the relative error. Okay, so that's a very crude reconstruction, so-called filtered back projection. Um, yeah, so that's also classical TV, if you're familiar with this. This is the reconstruction using sparse regularization. And you see now the problems here with the reconstruction. You see here, you have something very clean. Here it's uh, very blurry also here. And in general, you see there's a lot of blur in these areas. The next is the end-to-end -end approach. And you see it is already a bit, a bit better here, but really not, I mean, far from being perfect. And then, I mean, if you now combine both worlds, I mean, you get a recovery of this time. Uh, so now it's actually quite nice, clean here, clean here, and also this recovery looks looks much better. And if you like metrics, I mean, um, so there's this harp psi, which, which we introduced, relative error, and then there are also different other measures you usually use in imaging sciences, and the um, learning the invisible performs the best on all of those. Okay, so let's let's look at this other type of data which the network has never been exposed to, uh, which is a lotus root. So some colleagues in Helsinki slice the lotus root and put some metal stuff in. So that's that's the data. We now have third degree missing angle, and that is again the crude reconstruction, filtered back projection. Um, yeah, TB. So this is and this is um, sparse regularization, you see it's, it's, it's blurry in here and here. It's not as bad as before because it's just a 30 degree missing angle. But remember, the network has never seen this type of data before. Now, so this is the end-to-end uh, -end approach. Uh, so let's go back. This is the end-to-end -end approach. And then this is now, again, the learning, the invisible combining both worlds. 
Okay, so, so the second I would like to show you in this regard is um, another application which uh, where we also feel, follow this philosophy to combine Sorry, both worlds is very much, yes. Uh, can I uh, just uh, start with something new? Uh, one question. Yeah. What aspect of, of your method deals with the observational noise? Sorry? What, what aspect in your, um, in, 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 in your architecture or in, in, in your algorithm mm -hmm. Um, of you know first using the shear lids determining the ones that you show off and then using the network to get the ones that mm -hmm. you call the invisible ones mm -hmm. which aspect did this deal with the noise how do you deal with the noise well i mean the so already the sparse regularization in a certain sense deals with the noise because um so if, if you go back you see i mean this is already flexible so if there are some noise in the minimization yeah doesn't need to bring, bring doesn't need to bring this down to zero. Yeah, so that way you have here a bit of leeway also concerning the noise. Yeah. Like before you mentioned these other methods and you know the, the kind of the classical inverse uh, uh, way would you know would would um, would involve some filtering. So that would be on top of that, I suppose, right? So so, so if, if, if you so so if you mean I um yeah so do, do you mean this page or yes so you yeah have a and you need something to deal with some noise like yeah so so here I mean I this is about this yeah so the iterative solvers and um, you so here you use a neural network as an insertion in the iterative solver. Um, but now we use, let's say, the classical iterative solver, which also has this denoising step in. It's just not a neural network at this point. But the classical solvers have a, a denoising step in. And so this is basically also taking care of this, this part here. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, but then you can certainly, you could certainly also use a solver for this, which already has a neural network in. But here we would like to very cleanly separate, let's say, the model based approach from the uh, from the deep learning approach and only use, as I said, the learning uh, where it's really necessary. Thank you. Sure. Can I just also ask briefly two questions? Yeah. The first one is that I could imagine applications where you have a paucity of training data. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was wondering how much this relies on actually, like, to what extent is this kind of guessing what humans look like or what lotus fruits look like or is it to what extent is it just picking up kind of edges in images and if the mm -hmm. question makes sense yeah so that's a very good question so um what we did here we did some pre-training uh with some images of ellipsoids ellipsoidal shapes and then we did a fine training with this type of data so with, with humans with, with data from from this myo clinic so in that sense, the neural network already had at this point a sense of these ellipsoidal shapes, and then it fine trained, let's say, the fine structures, which usually, I mean, um, are associated with, uh, yeah, images of, of of humans in CT scanners. Now, so we had this two stage procedure. Thanks. I actually embarrassingly forgot my second question. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, there's still some time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, yeah, so the second um, problem I would like to show you um, is actually ready to the first meaning uh, how you can compute the wavefront set actually with such a combined approach. And again, we combine the model-based world, which now consists mainly of the shield transform with a data driven world, again, um, using a neural network. And the key idea, the key idea here is to which I think is also very useful in various instances is to not apply the neural network in the image domain, but in a different domain. Yeah, so what we here do is we first apply the shield transform to the image in a certain manner. Um, this brings the data in a domain where edges already have, let's say a much nicer structure and key features. And then we apply the neural network to those. Yeah, and this has, I mean, tremendous advantages. I mean, already here in the first instance, we, yeah, so the edge structures and directionality, so the wavefront set reveals itself and then the neural network, um, let's say, improves it even further. 
Uh, and so then, I mean, you can do things like, like this. So if this is your original data, I mean, a human would be actually able to detect edges, but classical algorithms fail miserably because, I mean, it's, it's very hard from such a blurry image to detect edge structures. Whereas our approach, which combines shearless with um, the data-driven approach, meaning neural networks, you get actually a very precise resolution of the edges. The color coding here corresponds to also the directionality of the edges. So not only do you find the positions, but you only know, also know which directionality it has in the sense of wave front sets. And then if you look, yeah, so these are also some metrics. Um, again, if you like metrics, you can see that it performs better than the others. But maybe let's look at some images again. If this is the original image, that's what a human might detect as edges. These are classical approaches. And again, using this combined approach, shearlets, applying the neural network in the shearlet domain, we get a very precise resolution of the different directions and edges. Yeah, and also here, I mean, it performs much better than even than approaches which use then neural networks typically end to end. Now, so therefore, I would really like to advocate combining the model-based world with the data-driven world with neural networks and uh, not use that end-to-end. -end. And then just as a comment, I mean, you can use this also, um, what I just showed you, computing the wavefront set for then solving inverse problems with like computer tomography, because you can use that now as a prior information. Um, so you can use it as a prior information um, for the sinogram, you bring it back, and then this could be your additional penalty term. Uh, so you can combine these two, these two um, results which I showed you to get then also, I mean, very precise recovery, even more precise than what I showed you with, uh, for instance, here an 80 degree missing angle. And you can also apply it to low dose CT. So what you do with your sinogram. You compute the wavefront set of the sinogram, then I mean, get even improved reconstructions. Okay, so this is um, about how to uh, short excursion, how to use neural networks for solving inverse problems. I would now like to come a bit to how to interpret the results. Yeah, so the, the general question is you have a neural network which is trained and uh, you want to analyze how it operates in a sense of opening the black box. That's certainly important for various reasons. Um, so you would like to often know the reason for a decision. If you train a neural network, it typically detects some structure which you might not be have been aware of. <clears throat> so also in general for scientists like biologists, chemists, it might be interesting to explain the neural network that trained on their data to get some additional insight and also certain trustworthiness can be approved. And in some sense, I mean, often you might aim for as a vision for the future of explanations, which are maybe even indistinguishable from a human explanation. You would like to interact with the neural network, ideally um, to understand how the decision process goes. Yeah, but we are far from this as we all know. Uh, and so, I mean, typically explainability methods do the following. So let's assume you have this three and the new, you have a trained neural network, which um, decided that this is indeed a three. So then you want to know where the neural network based its decision on. And then these algorithms put like a heat map or a relevance map on this input image, which tells you now, well, I mean, these red parts are very important for the decision um, for this particular neural network. Remember, we have a fixed trained neural network and maybe these blue ones played against it. Whereas if the neural network, if you have a trained neural network, which classifies this as an eight, that maybe the relevance map looks like this. So this was the neural networks thought that this would be pro the decision of an eight, but these would play against the decision of an eight. So you basically would like to know which features are most relevant for the decision, whatever feature mean. Here feature means pixels, but now you can debate whether pixel is actually a good feature, whether you might not want to have higher level features. And I would also yeah, briefly talk about that also. 
Uh, so, but there are a lot of challenges from the mathematical side. I mean, this whole area is on very shaky mathematical feet. Um, you would certainly like to know what is exactly relevant. So what does this red part mean? Is there a probability attached or something like this? What are, let's say, optimal relevance maps? Uh, can you also do it for not just images, for, for some other type of data? And also, how do you understand these problems neural networks has? For instance, have, for instance, these adversarial examples where with small modifications, you can radically change the decision. Okay, so what we do is we, we delve a bit into information theory. And so basically the essence of our idea is on this one slide. Um, so I, I have a classification function. And so I have an input signal here. Now let's assume my input signal is this image of, of a monkey. And I would like to know which are the relevant parts. Now, what does information theory do? So information theory consists always of two people, Alice and Bob. Alice has a message and she wants to send this message to Bob so that Bob also can read the message. She sends the message to Bob, uh, but she wants to send it as a small, at a small rate. So just very few parts. But Bob should be still able to recognize it. And so this is this rate distortion. The rate at which Alice sends should be low, but the distortion, maybe the error, meaning the error which Bob makes in, in encoding, in decoding the message should also be low. Okay, so how can we translate this? Alice had, say, has our original image, and she also has the neural network. Fine. Bob only has the neural network. So now Alice wants to send information to Bob so that Bob still recognizes this in a similar way. So Alice will certainly send the relevant parts of the image, yeah, and typically a partial image. Now Bob receives this partial image, and he would like to now decode it, meaning applying his neural network to it. He has a problem because now he just has parts of the image and the neural network only operates on entire images. So what he can do is, for instance, he can obfuscate it with random pixels, which hopefully will least disturb the meaning. And so then he puts this image, this obfuscated image in his neural network and gets also a decision. And hopefully the decision is almost the same as Alice's decision. Yeah, so that's viewing it from a rate distortion viewpoint. So the expected distortion is now the error. So this is the decision which Alice got from the original image. And that's the decision which Bob got from the disturbed image. And if the relevant part was chosen correctly, then hopefully this distortion is very small. And certainly Alice is interested to send as few pixels as possible. That is the rate but so that the distortion is still kept under control. Yeah, so that Bob doesn't get a completely different decision. Uh, and so therefore what's of interest is this rate distortion function. So you would like to have very few pixels. The S should be small, but the distortion should be kept under control. Okay, so that seems reasonable. That would lead to a very sparse explanation. Yeah, because the explanation would be just this, we go back, this partial image. Yeah, and I mean, conciseness is certainly, I mean, uh, a nice thing to aim for. We have a problem here because, I mean, this to compute this is hard and NP hard in several instances, even finding the minimizer is hard, but the approximation problem is hard in a similar manner. So, what do you do if something is hard? Well, you relax. Yeah, and so, before we looked at a discrete problem, we wanted to have pixels, um, look at the distortion and the rate was the number of pixels. We can make this continuous. We can now ask for each pixel to be assigned a value between zero and one. We can again obfuscate in a similar manner. The distortion also doesn't much change, but instead of counting here, we now choose the L1 norm, which as we also already saw promotes sparsity. So therefore, now this is the resulting minimization problem. You have here the distortion, you have here the sparsity, and the lambda is between them. And you see now it also fits very well into our framework for sparse regularization, which we already discussed in the beginning of the talk. 
Okay, so let's look at some examples. We take um, here, let's say the um, a very classical example, you have digits and the neural network should recognize the digits. So this are handwritten digits, which are, I mean, depending on your handwriting, mine is for instance, very bad. I mean, the network might have a very challenging task. And you have a fixed neural network, which does that with a certain test accuracy. Uh, and so then here are certain explanations at the original image, which the neural network correctly classify as a six. And here you say different explanations. Here you see ours. And well, I mean, it's nice, I think, to see what the neural network looked at. It also looked at this opening. Yeah, so these explanations, I don't know, it seems that the network looked at everything which is a bit unrealistic. So here we look at very concise explanations. And that way you can also compare um, different algorithms, which you see here, for instance, by comparing how many pixels lead to which distortion. Yeah, and now you, you will say, yeah, and you see, I mean, our algorithms do the best. Now can, you can say, well, okay, that, that's actually quite unfair. Huh? I mean, you, you tune it towards sparsity. So, I mean, then it seems unfair to compare it with the other algorithms. But then if you look at how the other approaches also analyze their result, what they do is they actually sort the pixels by relevance and then they start flipping from one side and check when the decision flips. And so this is in some sense the same as looking at the rate and looking at, at which part of the rate you get a different decision. No? So in that sense, I mean, they also use for checking their approach a rate distortion viewpoint. So then, I mean, one can also extend this um, to other modalities. So here, pixel explanations are just pixel-based. One can ask for whether other features might be more meaningful. Also, one can wonder whether noise and this um, obfuscation by random noise is the best. Uh, and so there, I mean, what we then did is here, we not obfuscated with random noise, but took the data distribution into account and also analyzed different modalities. Uh, and so, yeah, maybe not, not going too much into the details. So what we did here was we basically not used noise, but we used an in-painting gun, which gave us a more natural obfuscation. Uh, and also what we used was um, not looking at pixels, but we did a decomposition into wavelets before, and then placed the relevance measure on the wavelet coefficient. So that gave us now not pixel-based explanations, but more higher level explanations or more higher level features. Okay, so let's look at some examples. Um, what, what was, uh, I think for us very nice was this, let's say, wavelet decomposition of the image and analyzing which wavelet um, coefficients are relevant. Now, this image was classified as a baby by a neural network, um, which is obviously wrong. I mean, it's a dog with a, with a human. Pixel-based explanations don't tell you anything, but now if you use these higher level explanations, you see suddenly, I mean, this might be why the network has misclassified it because it saw a bit like a baby. Also here, you have a human with a sweater and with this higher level explanations, now it looks a bit like a screw. Yeah, so that way, I mean, you can reveal a bit why these adversarial examples happen. Um, yeah, and so these are other types of exam, other types of um, data. This is actually from a corporation with people from EE, from telecommunication. So they are interested in cell phone reception. And what you see here, these blue buildings are buildings. Oh, sorry. I mean, these blue parts are buildings. Um, these red dots are cell phone users. And these white blob here is uh, the cell tower. And then the neural network computed this black and white background, which indicated at each point how strong the signal there is. Yeah, and obviously if you stand behind a lot of 
buildings here and there's only this one cell tower, you will get a very bad reception. But then something very strange happens. And so you are wondering, you see there is a black, so a low reception area here, right in front of the cell tower, which doesn't make much sense. And so then we, we analyzed this with this explainability algorithm. And this algorithm told us, well, I mean, you see, the network based its decision on these cell phone users and, and these buildings. And these actually have bad reception. And so what then turned out was actually that there was a building missing in the city map. So the neural network did something actually correct because the cell phone, the data of the cell phone users was correct. It was just that there was a building missing. Okay, so that way you can also analyze whether your neural network did something reasonable or not. Okay, so let me let me finish with a word of caution, um, which also, I mean, an area which excites me a lot. I mean, so this is uh, here, I mean, joint work with a colleague from TU Munich and one of my PhD students. So now, I mean, you can go back to the basics in some sense. You can ask, can I actually train the neural network and can, can I compute it? So it's a computable problem. This comes from theoretical computer science, but also from logic. Um, so you can ask, is what I want to solve, so this training the neural network, a computer problem in the sense that you can compute this input output relation on a digital machine for any accuracy. Yeah, so remember, I mean, if you, you sit there now, maybe in front of your laptop, what you have in front of you is a digital machine, which is typically modeled as a Turing machine. Okay, so you can ask on this digital machine, can I compute it? And what we found out is that actually the solution of a fundamental inverse problem is actually not Turing computable and even not what's called banach mazur computable, particularly also by a neural network. So that that is certainly, I mean, a, let's say a bold statement and uh, actually maybe a bit also uh, to some extent scary statement, which means, I mean, that this solution on, on a digital machine is not computable with, this, with an arbitrary accuracy. So if you have your now your theoretical accuracy bounds, well, I mean, you will get an output, but you can never check whether the bounds are actually obeyed. So there does not exist an algorithm which on digital hardware derives a neural network approximately in the solution for any given accuracy. So you could only design an algorithm specifically for every accuracy, but there's no general algorithm which does it for any accuracy. So in that sense, the output is not reliable and it could point why you have this instability and non-robustness problem. So there are, on today's hardware, I mean, fundamental limits of computability. And so you can ask now what to do and it points, I think, in exciting directions. There are new emerging hardware like neuromorphic computing, also biocomputing, which are more analog models. And so you can ask now what happens then and what we could show is that in fact, the solution of a fine dimensional inverse problem on such an analog machine is computable. Uh, so that shows you that from this viewpoint, there's a huge difference between this classical hardware, which we work on now and future hardware. Uh, because on one, I mean, and we are now also working on looking at other problems like classification problems, on one type of hardware, it's not accessible in that sense, but if you expand your model for computing, it is. So let me conclude. Um, we talked about applications of neural networks to inverse problems. We, we saw in the model-based side that you typically solve them by sparse regularization. We should, or let's say this is one way to do that, but if you just stay on this model-based side, you might reach a barrier. Deep neural networks are, I mean, the state of the art for inverse problems. Um, yeah, a bit of problem is that the theoretical foundation right now is almost still, I mean, to a certain extent missing. And then what I showed you is that it's quite advantageous to combine both sides. I showed you two applications. Um, we then also discussed interpretability or explainability how once you have your trained network, which did something, you can check uh, how it reached 
that output and in the end we talked a bit about computability on digital hardware and with this i'd like to thank you for your attention thanks very much it was great great talk i have one question could you go back to the boat the image of the boat when you use this edge extractor the dens at the boat there's this sort of um raft in the sand at the bottom left that like for a human who knows you know something about it, it's clear that there's a line you know something has been dragged along the sand but in mm. the intense this is just part of the sort of the sandy noise there and and you couldn't see that you know organized feature um is can you maybe comment on that so, so sorry actually it's even hard for me to see so you're saying okay so there has been something dragged here and you you well, would you, not like to recognize it as an edge or yeah, there's sort of the, the, there's a, a, a large scale feature composed of many many small. Scales. Oh, I see. It's this vertical drag there, like yeah, that one. Yeah. Okay. And it doesn't seem to see that as some some global large scale feature, but just as little small scale features, and so you can't see it. Yeah, yeah, I I, I see. So these other are, are much more clear to to determine. Yeah, it, I think one problem is then also the resolution sometimes because here you do a shield transform and the shields might therefore not resolve it that precisely. So therefore it goes more to the, let's say, um, small scales in a certain sense where it then recognizes it. Uh, I mean, I think, sure, I mean, you, you see, you. I mean, as a human, uh, you are absolutely right. You see it as a strip, but um, if you look at it, it's it's kind of wrecked in some certain sense. It's not really a clear oh, line. The features so with, some line the, with some kind of global correlation, with some large scale correlation. But it seems that the algorithm can't see that large scale correlation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So way around that. Yes, but but I think it's because of the structure. I mean, these other. Um, yeah, so these other lines are more, let's say, more, more clear, and therefore it recognizes it more as large scale structures, whereas this is, I mean, it, itself a bit, I mean, also due to the sandy structure, I think much more right. Yeah. So I was fascinated by your um, kind of impossibility result. And I was just wondering so, is this, so you're saying that. Um, so I have a finite dimensional inverse problem. So essentially I have some M by N matrix and then I want to solve. So can, can you, are you able, able to give any um, further ideas of why this holds and, or how you show this? I think to a certain extent, I mean, so, so the proof is quite technical. Uh, there's a lot of logic involved, but to a certain extent, I mean, the problem is still analog. Um, so if you now bring to the, um, to the let's say uh, digital world, I mean, then then you have a problem, and then so then this is a accuracy problem holds uh, or appears. So so in that sense, I mean, most of these problems still have a, let's say an analog analog background to a certain extent, and so therefore, I mean, these analog methods then perform that much better than than what you see here. Yeah, because I mean, although it's fine dimensional, certainly, I mean, each number is a is a real value. And so if you then discretize or digitalize this, I mean, that, that causes uh, the, the problem. If you have an intrinsically digital problem, I mean, then you, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have this, uh, this um, result of the type. And is it possible that there's like intrinsically digital problems which will always fill all humans? Which, which, sorry, which will what? Which will kind of, could one, obtain a kind of opposite result which is that there's like fundamentally digital problems which mm -hmm. um will always trick humans like that humans will always put, uh, do badly on if you believe oh. that we do real number computations i see yeah maybe there are i don't know i yeah off the top of my head i i i couldn't imagine anything but yeah I, i'm sure one yeah yeah well, one could construct something like this but i yeah, could, could be. I, I I don't know at this point. Yeah. Also, maybe one final question. You, you said um, briefly, and I missed what you said, how you were thinking about generalization in the initial um, Sheila approach to inverse problems. Could you oh. re-say yeah, yeah. what you meant by generalization there? Yeah, so generalization always means you have you have given data where you train your neural network on, 
and then you expose it to other types of data. And so here, um, the viewpoint I took was, we have these uh, images of humans where you trained your neural network on, and now you expose it to something very different, namely this, this lotus root data. And still it performs actually quite good. So that was what I meant. Sorry, can I just ask one question about the, the example with the, the cell phone users and the buildings, if you could go back to that one. I wanted to make sure I understood that properly. What, what was the input data and the output data in that case? What, what was the computer being given? Oh, I see. So, so the network was, was given this cell phone user data. So every red dot, the, the yeah. data there and um, the, the image, the city map and the, um, the position of the cell tower. And I mean, I you can even train it in such a way. Yeah, so this is what, what was here, but you can even train it just giving it the cell phone tower and the, the position of the buildings. Um, right, so it, it was not given the position of the buildings that had to construct that, is that correct? It, it was, it was given those, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, and so, so it thought that you had the, the area of low cell phone coverage where there was a building, and the correct answer was that it should have been able to construct a building, but instead got low cell phone coverage, or is that, is that yeah, right? Yeah, so, so, okay, so so here, yeah, I mean, the, the neural network then put, didn't put here, let's say that much, not that much emphasis on the fact that there was no building, but it put a lot of emphasis on the fact that there were people with bad reception and therefore it, it created this black, black dot. I see, right. Okay, thanks. I just had one question about the sensitivity thing that you went through of like trying to figure out where the neural network is paying attention to. So you had this relaxation where you find this like mask between zero and one. Could you say a little bit more about how you actually find that in any kind of efficient way? Yeah, I mean, oh, okay. So there, there are classical solvers how to solve. So this is a classical sparse regularization problem. I mean, there are various solvers how to, how to, how to approach this. Um, so these are typically iterative solvers. Okay. So I mean these are yeah I think I mentioned them them here um, if you if you think about it, let's say whatever it, yeah so so what I said here iterative solvers to solve this Douglas Rockport ADMM and so on so there are various solvers you can you can uh, take so just using the neural network they're like a black box um, like it doesn't really or yeah. like it's yeah. like differentiable structure of it or anything yeah okay thanks and there I guess in principle you get a whole spectrum for different lambda and you can look mm -hmm. at them and see if you can extract meaning from them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so so the lambda you actually have to choose beforehand. Um, so that's always a bit tricky how to choose. Let's say the uh, what is it? Yeah, how to choose the best lambda. So that's I mean there are also approaches how to do that, but that's that's a bit tricky. Yeah. So I have an off-topic question. So not not on machine learning and uh, networks, but on the shear nets. Um, so back in the 1990s, people used wavelets to study turbulence and, you know, study um, energy spectrum and, and, you know, the, the um, distribution of vortices, identifying vortices that are sort of neither localized in, in Fourier space nor localized in, in spatial space. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are you aware of that people use shearlets um, to study those problems? Because they seem like if you have filamental structures or so, they seem to be... Yeah, you know, yeah designed to do that. Are, are you aware of that? Have people done that? I'm not aware of any, let's say, particular work, but certainly, I mean, this, this would be, I mean, seems quite fitting in that respect. Yeah, absolutely. Because, um, yeah, so she, I think, would give you a very good representation. I mean, it, it uh, let's say, exposes the direct structure in a, yeah. I think, in a, in that sense, optimal manner, yeah. That people are interested in there, um, in, in, in for turbulence. So this might be a nice way to, to you know, look at singularities in, um, let's thank Gita very much for a um, fantastic talk and as at a very early time, thank you so much for that. <laughs> sure, it was a pleasure. <laughs>